Welcome, everybody. All right, so today we're going to talk about Game Studio Management. This is my 20th GDC. Yeah. And what better way to celebrate than talking about Game Studio Management. Okay, uh, so for people who don't know about my situation, I've worked at a lot of places over the years. One place I got a lot of education about studio management was at Disney Imagineering, uh, where I was the creative director of the Disney Virtual Reality Studio. Also, for the last 12 years or so, I have taught at the Entertainment Technology Center at Carnegie Mellon University, where I, at this point, I guess I've helped oversee hundreds of different teams uh, make various game projects. And also, for the last 12 years, I've run my own studio, Shell Games, which is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We started out with about five people, and over the years, we have gradually grown up to our current staff of 100 people. Um, and so part of what I'll be able to talk about today is uh, some of those transitions and some of the things you run into. So first, I would like to ask, who here is really excited about management? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. All right, I see a lot of ironic hand raises there. <laughs> and then I see a lot of, yeah, and there's no way, no. And, and, uh, and I guess I have to wonder, like, really, did you see what was on the door? I mean, it's, it's a management talk all up in here. Because um, one of the things we find in the game industry, let me ask this question, who here is excited about making great games? Raise your hand. Yeah, there's all the hands, right? And that is the thing in the game industry. People are not super excited about management all the time. Some people are. Um, but everybody's excited about making great games. But the management still needs to get done, and so a lot of it is bad, as we know, because people just aren't that into it. Because most of us, you know, when it comes to management, you know, we're kind of this guy right here, you know. I'd, I'd much rather be focusing on my games uh, and not having to deal with all this management BS. And this often leads to a lot of problems. So some of the common problems that you get from bad management, right? Um, you're in a situation, you're like, I don't know how to structure management because, hey, I, didn't, I don't have an MBA. What do I know about this? I don't know how things should be structured, particularly as your studio is growing. I've got this one project. I'm not sure what's the right way, what is the best and optimal way to manage this given project. Oh, my God, we had another miscommunication with a client. You know, we thought they s understood what we meant when we said we were cutting the combat, but no, they didn't understand. So you got that, and then tell me, tell me if you've ever had this problem. Too many meetings, right? I don't think I've ever been anywhere where people haven't said, oh my God, did you just have too many meetings? Low morale, it's embarrassing, it happens sometimes. And like, you went into games because you wanted to be awesome, and then if you're going to work every day and it's not awesome, then that is not awesome. Now the next one I'm sure has never happened to anyone in this room. Late games. Late games are not an accident or, you know, you can't just blame it on the creative process. Late games is bad management. That is what that is. And then the last one, the worst one, the one that we never talk about at GDC, our game sucks. Oh, man, damn it. We worked on this a year and a half and it sucks, right? So those are things that happen all the time. They happen to everybody. And uh, the key is finding a way to fix these things. Okay, so when I was trying to understand this stuff, because, you know, I, you know I, I don't come from a place where I'm like, you know, had some super amazing management education or anything. Um, as, particularly as my studio started to grow, it's like, man, what are we gonna do? And I, thinking kind of broadly about it, I couldn't help but think about ants and bees. Because, you know, ants and bees get a lot done. Oh my God, they get all this stuff done. Like, look at this. The bees built that, right? They got together and said, yeah, we're going to build this. And they did it. Look how perfect it is. There was no design document, right? <laughs> there's, there was no daily scrum, right? There's, there's no deadlines, right? It was, they just like, no, we're just going to get together. We're all going to do this, and it's going to be awesome. So how is that possible? And check this one out. Here's this guy. He's really into ants. So he finds abandoned anthills, and he gets a big five-gallon drum of dental plaster, and he pours it down slowly, slowly into the anthill, waits for it to harden, and then slowly, carefully digs it out and hangs it up. And that's the interior of an anthill. Those, um, those little spirally things are tunnels, 
uh, going down, sort of corkscrew tunnels that the ants make. And those little flat leaves hanging off are rooms that the ants have created. Most of the lower rooms are kitchens where food is prepared uh, for the rest of the colony. And they do all this with no meetings. <laughs> so I want to understand how is that possible, because I'd like to live in a world with no meetings. What's going on? So then I read this book, The Superorganism, uh, by a couple of guys who really studied the heck out of insect societies. And uh, they explain a lot of it. And one of the key quotes I liked was actually from another book. The formation of a higher level unit by integrating lower level units will succeed only if the emerging organization acquires the appropriate technologies for passing information among its members. And I think the key phrase there is passing information. It's really weird to think about ants and bees having information technologies, um, but that's exactly what they have. They have systems of communicating with each other in, in evolved, organized ways so that the right information gets to the right insects at the right time so that they all know what to do for the good of the whole organization. So it's very efficient. Okay, so I got thinking about that, man, man that's cool. They, they, they sort of do have meetings, but they're just really, really efficient. They're so efficient you don't even notice they're having them. So thinking about that, then thinking about other things, about this notion of information. Um, a lot of philosophers have been talking about information lately. We used to talk, you know, philosophers used to talk about the universe made of matter and the elements. And then they started saying, no, the universe is really made of energy. And now the modern thing is actually the universe may be made entirely of information and nothing else. And that's an interesting idea. And then I got to thinking about kind of Eastern medicine and body meridians and acupuncture. And when you talk to Western doctors about it, a lot of times they say, well, that doesn't really exist. Chi energy flowing around the body, you show me. It's not there. You can't see it. It doesn't exist. It's not there. This is a placebo effect. But anyone who's had a massage or meditates or, uh, or has undergone acupuncture or does Tai Chi um, has experienced this energy flow. And I've often wondered if, well, okay, maybe chi isn't like electrical energy or, or something or some mystical force flowing around. What if it is a kind of information traveling in the body? Because we know that our body is a big information network. It would be like if I said, hey, here's the internet. There are viruses on it. Point them out as you look at the physical network. You might conclude that, no, they don't exist because they're invisible. And Christopher Alexander, um, one of the greatest geniuses of our time, um, that's another talk for another day. Uh, in his books, he talks about space being defined by channels of energy. And I think we've all experienced this. You know, as you move through cities, there are certain channels where there's good energy and bad energy. And even in your living room, there's the spots where everybody kind of moves through, and then there's that dead corner that everything is kind of weird, and you realize, I should move the couch, and that, so because that, that corner feels weird and bad. So you have that kind of, uh, in, that, that may be a kind of information flow. And in our studios, there's everybody working away, and you can see people working, and you can look at their emails, and you can see that stuff, but the thing that you can't see is the relationships between people, and the relationships end up defining an awful lot of how things happen at the company, but they are invisible, um, unless Google comes out with some new app that like lets you, you see that, but we, don't, we can't see that uh, just yet. Oh my God, that's why Facebook bought Oculus, I just realized. <laughs> anyway, um, so as uh, as Supri said in uh, The Little Prince, what is essential is invisible to the eye. And so just because these things are invisible doesn't mean we shouldn't focus on them. And in fact, maybe it means we should focus on them all the more. A book that was very influential on me is this book, Design Yourself by Kareem Rashid. Uh, it has a lot of really kooky advice in it, but the spirit of the book is what influenced me the most. His fundamental uh, idea is that you should design your life so that you like it. You shouldn't just live your life or just deal with things. You should look at the things you don't like and say, okay, you know what? This is a design problem. I'm going to design this so that I like it. And when it comes to how to get studio management going, if you don't like the information flows in your studio, you need to design them so that they are good. But in order to do that, you need to know what is the information in your studio. And that's a little tricky because, again, it's invisible. And and we don't always see it. So let's meditate for a second on the notion of information.
Can we get the sound up? Yeah. All right, maybe we'll get the sound. There we go. By hook or by crook, we will. Right, so getting information is difficult, and it may take a lot of hooks and a lot of crooks uh, in order to get it out of a studio. So at first it seems kind of daunting, like let me look at all the information that's flowing around in my studio. Um, so I tr tried to come up with simple things and I couldn't do it. I was taking this top-down approach of trying to dissect information in the studio and was kind of failing. And so I sat down with Chuck Hoover and we started making a big list of like, well, let's talk about all the many, many kinds of information that are in the studio. And here's, we just made this big crazy list with hundreds and hundreds of elements. And here's some samples, right, that we took a very bottom-up approach. You know, hey, there's a change to this project. Hey, there's a new project. Hey, we got a new studio policy. Hey, there's a best practice for the right way to do C-sharp coding. Um, we're having a birthday party on Friday. Um, hey, the project's in a little trouble. Hey, I'm, I'm really uneasy. Oh, I'm super confident about this. I'd like to throw a red flag on the way that we're documenting everything. Um, I need help. Uh, that Benson guy, I don't, I don't, I don't trust that guy at all. Um, hey, uh, um, hey, clients, we got something to tell you. Um, wait, no, who's, who's good at what? Are you good at this and are you good at that? I'm, I'm blocked, I can't, I've got nothing to do. Hey, I've got an idea. Hey, we're out of paper towels. Um, that Benson guy, he's an idiot, oh my God, <laughs> right? All right, the, the studio mission is, is this. Um, I'm from Idaho. Um, this information that I'm telling you, it's very, very secret. I'm, 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 I'm really upset right now. Um, I'm about to start coding this module right now. Anyway, so there's all these kinds of information. And like it seems sort of overwhelming when you're like, yeah, this is all flowing around. What am I gonna do with this? Um, so looking at it and kind of shaking it around, we started to come up with categories and I, I realized that there were some simple categories of information. One of them is sort of obvious, facts, duh. A lot of information is facts. Okay, everybody knows that. And then other information is opinions. Sure, okay, we know, we know that. There are facts and there are opinions. Okay, that's an information uh, hierarchy right there. And, but then there's something else, emotions. Now some people would say, no, 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 those are just opinions. And I said, mm -mm, no, they're not, right? <laughs> they are not. I am mad at you, that is not opinion. That is a stone cold fact, right? <laughs> so weirdly, emotions are actually more facts than they are opinions, but they're not like pure objective facts. They're very personal kind of facts, so I find it, a good idea to separate those out because emotions travel differently than normal facts do. So those are three kinds of information, facts, opinions, and emotions, and they are about things. And what are they about it, when you're at, in a game studio? Well, a lot of times they're about projects. It's like, hey, we're working on this project, and I have facts, opinions, and emotions about that project. Separate from that, they're about processes. Processes outlive projects sometimes. Sometimes they live within a project, but processes are really kind of separate from projects. The way you do things, how you do things. And then the third one is people, um, because people are doing these projects. Okay, well that's a thing, maybe you can break that out. You have facts, opinions, and emotions about projects, processes, and people. Well, okay, that's something. Does that cover everything? I don't know, it's not perfect. But going back to the spreadsheet and going back to the big thing, kind of made the six columns, you know, and started to kind of check it off, and it's like, yeah, you know, studio pol new studio policy, that's, that's a fact about a process. Um, well, hey, I need help, that's an opinion about a project, and, and, and I'm blocked, that's a, that's a fact, you know, and it's, a, and it's about, a, about a project, and probably about a process, too. Um, and we found, like, yeah, this seems to cover things, so that's kind of cool, that's kind of interesting. Um, okay, well, so that, that's a way to break down information. Now we need to look at, like, where does information, where does that information go, because information is not static. The first thing to think about is the fact that we ourselves are information networks. We are not just like a point on a graph, we are a complex information network inside ourselves and inside our minds. And if you've ever tried to think of a name and you can't think of it, and then two minutes later you thought of it, like, yeah, that's because the information was in there the whole time, it just had a little trouble, it got caught in a router somewhere and could not find its way out. So first, we are information networks. But then, of course, it's hierarchical because you connect up with other people in the studio. So there's internal information flow and then this external information flow. And then it's hierarchical again because the studio communicates with other entities, maybe a publisher, maybe with your players, uh, maybe you a licensor or the press or outsource partners or all kinds of other things. So you have these sort of hierarchies of information flow. All right, so that's useful to think about. But now, the way all information flows is not created equal. 
um, in, the, uh, in the business world, we tend to use four main ways of communication. Face-to-face, uh, -face, we do a lot. We, as more and more, we're doing Skype, sort of video conference, uh, phone calls sometimes, and then lots and lots of email. And as much as some people would like to believe that all these are equivalent, they certainly are not. We have lots of evidence that they are not. And it's interesting to wonder about why. The key seems to be that the things at the top, you're getting much more information. And the things at the bottom, you're getting much less. Face-to-face -face communication is a lot of information. Because yes, you are hearing my words, but you're also hearing my tone of voice. You're seeing my facial expression. But then it gets even weirder and deeper than that. Because that's all with your conscious mind. Your subconscious mind is very good at communicating with other people face to face. Is there's well-documented notion of micro-expressions. Micro-expressions are generally when there's a conflict within you, you want to communicate one thing, but you, you want to hide your emotions. You can't hide them perfectly. And so there is a period of about 40 milliseconds where you make these tiny expressions that show your true emotions. And you can't see them very well consciously, but your subconscious totally picks up on them. You ever have that moment, someone's saying something, you're like, something's not right about that. That guy's trying to pull something. It's often because your subconscious picked up on a micro expression. Now, given that those last about 40 milliseconds, and given that Skype, on average, gives you about 20 frames a second, you are unlikely to pick up micro expressions through Skype. Um, so that's important. Uh, another one is, this is going to sound really crazy, smell. We, a subconscious picks up on the smells of other people and emotions are communicated through smell. Uh, there have been studies done, it's a weird study, right? We have two groups. One group's gonna watch a comedy movie, the other group's gonna watch a horror movie. And they each put pads under their armpits, all right? And they watch the movie. And then the pads are collected up and an unfortunate third group of people <laughs> is asked to smell the pads. And better than average, they can tell which movie was being watched. Because you really can smell fear. And, but you can't smell it over Skype. Yet. I don't, no, I don't, I don't know what that means. Anyway, um, this is important because fear is an important thing on projects. You know, some, hey, you gonna get that done by Friday? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm gonna get it done, right? Yeah, really, right? And you, uh, anyway, so face-to-face -face is really, really important. Tone of voice is really important, which is why a you know, phone, even a phone call can be better than email. But you know, so, so choosing the right channel of information at the right time is really important. So now, when it comes to scaling, um, people often feel like as their studio is growing, you, you hear a lot of thoughts about scale. There are some people who say, you can never do a good game with more than five people. And then there's other people who say, you can never do a good game with more than 20 people, right? And, and uh, but then you see big studios that do good games and what's exactly is happening? And why is it different with more people? What is it that changes? Well, the key thing is just simply this. Um, the number of interactions between people goes up in kind of an exponential way, technically the triangle numbers pattern, right? Um, th three people working together, you just, it's easy, right? You just, the channels of communication are really simple. But even when you get up to something as small as seven people, like look at all those different paths of information. And this becomes really important. If you're on a team of five people, every day when you come in, you all talk to each other every day. When you're on a team of 20 people, you're not necessarily gonna talk to everybody every day, but you'll probably talk to everybody, at least have some minor contact with them once a week. Once you get up to 50 people, you might go four weeks, six weeks, and there might be somebody in the studio who you have not exchanged one word with in all that time. And it may be that they have some super important piece of information for you, but you wouldn't know it because, um, you, you know, because the, the place is big. And so what we do is we try and set up organizational structures in order to try and get the right information to the right places at the right time because it's not gonna happen simply organically this way. So this is why we have org charts. Here's a picture of the org chart for shell games. Um, and org charts are typically organized by uh, discipline. Um, you know, we've got our production team and our engineering team and our design team and our art team um, and our operations team. And that's pretty simple and straightforward, but nowhere in there do you see reflected anything about our projects. We do six to eight projects at a time. 
Um, but you sure couldn't figure that out by looking at this organizational chart, because the point of this organization is not to talk about projects, but to talk about specific discipline things, to talk about things that have to do with art or talk about design. So a lot, this is really very much a chart about mentoring and just sort of getting information to the right people about their discipline. And so for studios to do more than one project, this is why it's become very common to use a form of matrix management. Matrix management is a simple idea. The idea is that you, re you were sort of report to two people when you're on a team. You report up, you know, if you're a programmer, you report up to the head of engineering or head of programming, whatever, and you, you work with them on things that are about sort of long-term mentoring and coaching. But on your project, someone else is in charge of your project. Um, in, at our place, we, use a, we always have a producer and a director at the head of every project. Um, the director is responsible for the creative vision and making sure it's great. The producer is responsible for making sure it's done on time and that everyone has everything they need. Now, some people say to me, that's a bad idea. We can't have two people in charge of a project. That's like having two gods. It doesn't work. Um, and I say, no, I think it's more like having two parents. Uh, it's, it's kind of a good idea sometimes. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. They have different areas of expertise. The people running your project are, are focused on, on two different things. And then similarly, backing out to the matrix management point of view, the, there's the people in charge of your project and the people in charge of your discipline. And it's good to be able to talk to the two of them about two different things. You talk to the people at the head of your project about project issues and the people, the person at the head of your department about longer term issues. And if you've got a problem with one of them, you can go to the other and say, man, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hitting a logjam with this guy. Can you help me? And then they can often help you out. So the, the reason matrix management seems to be a good idea and is used frequently is because it, it allows two different kinds of channels of information. So, so uh, organizational structure is one tool for managing your, your flow. A second one is office space. Now, everybody rolls their eyes when it comes to office space. Nobody feels good about it. Um, People rarely get excited about, yeah, man, our office is so incredible. You don't hear that. People are like, ugh, they just, it feels, it feels bad, it feels corporate. And that's often because it's not well designed. Now, it is a hard, hard design problem. Um, but when you, if you work at it, you can certainly make it better. So there's a lot of things to think about when you're designing your office space. One thing is to realize that a little distance is a lot of distance. So here's an illustration of a thing I literally saw right outside uh, you know, my desk one day. We had a project, there were four people working on it. And three of them were sitting right next to each other like that. And then in the middle, you see this kind of a low counter, that green bar up the middle it was just a low counter, no big deal. Like people stored things in it. And on the other side of that counter was this other guy with his other desk. Couldn't have been more than 15 feet, okay, from those three desks to that one desk. And, but, but we're like, we were observing that there was some bad communication problem where that one guy kept getting left out of the loop. And we're like, man, that guy, is he dope? Why isn't he talking? Is he just lazy? Is he ignorant? And then just watching, it's like, oh my God, I could see it happening. Someone would be like, hey, I've got a problem. And the guy next to him would say, yeah, what is it? Well, it's this and this and this. And the guy over there is kind of like, wait, is you guys talking? Uh, and you can see he's kind of listening. He's like, no, I don't want to interrupt him. I'll get back to work. And he was just left out of the loop. We simply moved his desk over next to the others. And like the problems got like so much better, right? So thinking about that is, is really important. A lot of notable companies have really gotten aggressive about office space. Pixar is one that's very notable. A lot of times you walk into some big fancy company and you go into this big open space and you do that here when you go to Pixar. And that open space is full of weird sculptures and creepy security guards and like you don't really see, it doesn't appear to have any point or purpose other than to intimidate you or whatever. When you walk into Pixar, you're in the cafeteria. Look, I mean, these are the, the ben, this is the places people sit and eat in the cafeteria. You walk right in and it's, it's the central hub of the building. And the whole space is designed very much to get people to cross through this space as many times as possible. All the bathrooms, for example, are in this central space. The offices are off on like hallways that go out to the sides and people are forced to cross through this many times. This, all the op meeting rooms, you see all those glass walled things up there? Those are the meeting rooms. You can stand in the middle and kind of see, oh, there's that where that guy is. Oh, look, there's a vacant meeting room. You can, you can see all that stuff. Um, it's very, very much design. Uh, interestingly, Steve Jobs was very, very involved in the design of this particular space. Uh, we've tried to take a very similar approach at our space, trying to have things be very, very open. You know, we don't have 1,500 people like Pixar does. We have about 100. Um, but we uh, are big fans of open plan. And uh, 
so you can see there's most of the folks kind of working down there. The way groups are organized is by project. We move desks around all the time. Anytime there's new projects, we get desks so, we, so people can get together. And you'd think we, we, were, we would maybe organize them by um, those kind of islands that you see, but they're really organized by canals. Okay, so people with back-to-back -back are the ones working on projects together because someone could say, hey, can you take a look at this? And they can just turn around and take a look. It's very different than, oh, can you walk all the way around the island and come and see us? It's just a small design thing, but it, it makes a big difference. Okay, so office space is really important. There's so, there's a, that's, that's, I could talk about that for, for days and days. But uh, let's talk about other things. Another really important flow management tool is ritual. And our most common ritual is meetings, right? And uh, people never, they mostly don't feel great about meetings because there's a lot of bad meetings because no one bothers to design them. Well-designed meetings are awesome. Um, you go in, you get stuff done, it was like, oh, that really helped me. You come out thinking, man, now I know what's going on, that really helped me, now I can, I can work with more confidence, I know exactly what's going on. Badly designed meetings are I don't know, the ninth level of hell. They're, they're really, really bad. And there's a lot of ways to design meetings. People who do, actually, hands up, people who do Agile. I'm curious, look at, there's a lot of Agile here, and there's a lot of people like, I don't do Agile, maybe I should, I don't know. What's, or, I hate Agile, stupid jerks, you know, it's a lot of things. But anyway, one of the key elements of Agile is the notion of the Scrum meeting. And this is very, very much a designed meeting. The idea is it's very short, you're talking about a very small number of things, and often, part of the design is people say, this is a standing meeting. There'll be no sitting down in this meeting because we want to get this done and get back to work and, get, and not, not uh, turn this into a, a waste of time. And so that's cool. Look at these happy people having their scrum meeting right here. Uh, and you know why they're happy? Because they're out of those horrible cubicles that they're in. Look at those. <laughs> those are like the worst of both worlds when it comes to cubicles, right? Um, so, because look at the height of those. You go back and sit in that. Do you have noise protection? Are you like, ah, oh, I'm in my isolated pod? No, there's like all the potential noise of the studio is there. Can you see where anyone is or what anyone is doing? No, even if you stand up, you can't. You've got to peek up like over the wall. So it's like this illusion of, oh, I have a big important office, but with all the horrible aspects of, of that. I, I am not a fan of the six foot high uh, cube wall. Okay, so, so the talking more broadly about Agile, Agile is really just a system of coordinating and, and uh, organizing information flow, right? You've got your product backlog. These are all the things that we would like to put into the game. And then you organize sprints, these little you know, two, three, four week um, uh, sessions where you have a very specific goal. Everyone knows the goal. You've communicated the goal clearly. We're going to deliver this at the end of 30 days. And then once a day, you have your your uh, scrum meeting where, what'd you do yesterday? What'd you do today? What problems are you having? Okay, good, let's get back to work. And let's change it uh, so that we know uh, what we're doing. And that's all very much about organizing information flow about what we're doing so that you can optimize continually on the project. Fred Brooks, author of The Mythical Man Month, um, you know, he was looking at how bad software projects tend to go and someone was saying, look, I don't understand you software people. You said it was going to be out by this date, and you were a year late. I can understand somebody being two days late or a week late. A year late. How are you a year late for something? Yeah, don't worry, honey. I'll meet you at 5 o'clock. Oh, sorry, I'm a year late. <laughs> right? And his answer is, you get a year late one day at a time. That is how you do it. And so the idea is to do this sort of daily management so that you can steer the project, get the right information to the right people, and steer your project. Okay, so Agile is really a system of information uh, flow. So another popular thing, uh, popular with some people, less popular with others, is the notion of 360 feedback. People tend to dread feedback reviews at work. Most of the time, the people giving the reviews don't know what they're doing because they haven't they're not experts in this. It's super awkward. You're having this awkward conversation about what you're good at and what you're bad at. And like, do I trust this guy? And is this guy going to believe me? Often, this is because it's badly designed. Uh, Well-designed 360 feedback is an opportunity to collect feedback from all the people that somebody works with and get all the information that maybe they say to each other, but maybe they don't because it's really awkward. Like, like, dude, your BO is killing me, right? That is not a conversation that two employees will often have, but
but sometimes it's the sort of thing that'll come out in anonymous 360 feedback. If it's anonymous, um, uh, and you can guarantee the information's not gonna go, it'll often go up to, uh, to one of the managers who can kind of have this conversation, which makes it essential that the people who are giving these reviews know how to do them well and understand how to do it tactfully and usefully. If they, a good manager collects the information from a bunch of people, processes it so that they figure out, okay, these are the useful things I wanna pass on and discuss and, and hear this person's uh, feedback about, um, and, and it becomes a conversation. And if you do this right, people don't dread the reviews. They're, they're you know, like, they get useful information that helps them, and it can be very, very positive, but you have to take it seriously. One thing we recently did, because we realized, you know, it's tough to fit these in. You're like, I wanna focus on the game. I don't wanna focus on filling out forms and, and, um, and like sitting down having uncomfortable conversations. So you tend to put it off. And we'd been doing that, and that really sends this message that hey, if you put this off, it must not be important. But it's super important. This is all about making everybody the best person they can be. So we've rescheduled it now. Instead of doing them all once a year, or um, once every uh, uh, six months, we spread them out so they fit into people's schedules so that they're not an intrusion. And that's made it much more comfortable, and, it's, and again, helps send the signal that look, this is important to us, we make time for this. So there are many, many types of meetings. Any kind of meeting that you have is a sort of ritual that your company has, and you want to design that so it's good. Some of those are short and daily. Many of them are weekly. Some of them you do every like four times a year. Um, and then there's some you do annually. One that we do that was worked out really well for us is this notion of jam week. We stop everything that the studio is doing once a year, and we uh, say, you know what, let's have people work on projects that they are excited about, that they think might be good to go somewhere, you know, just some, something good could come with this, my, either my personal development or maybe um, just uh, something that would be really good for the studio. Now, is this an information flow management situation? It totally is. People have ideas for things that they'd like to do, and it's blocked because it's not part of their regular daily projects. This creates an opportunity for like, hey, that cool idea bouncing around in your head, we're making time. It's important to us. We're making time for it to come out and for you to experiment and connect with other people. And good things come of it. Last year, um, one of ours was uh, this Enemy Mind game that came out and everybody liked it so much after a one week prototype that we're like, let's turn this into a real project. And it got a best in play award last year, at GDC. And one of the ones we did this year is this uh, Ryan Trail game, which we currently have in Kickstarter. And it's in its final week, so please back it. I think we're gonna make it, but it's, it's a little close. So anyway, so if you could, uh, if you could back that, that would, that would be great. Anyway, um, but it's, it's exciting. I mean, it's, it, people get really energized when the things they're excited about come to light and you have to make channels for that to happen. But there's lots of other rituals. There's this great story I read about on the Harvard Business Review I just loved. So this company where they didn't have a modern coffee pot. They had this clanky old percolator coffee pot. Only two people in the office knew how to operate it properly and not get grounds in all the coffee, right? And so when they would make coffee, they would get the coffee going and they'd say, you know, hey everybody, coffee's ready, and everybody would come for coffee, and everybody would hang out in the kitchen, chatting and stuff, and a lot of useful information was flowing around. And the, uh, the guy who was the head of the studio, he's like, yeah, you know, that's great, look at this, this is so cool, I love our little coffee times, and everybody's talking, and this is, this is cool, this is cool and good and useful, but geez, I feel terrible that everyone's got this terrible coffee pot, right? So you know what I'm gonna do, because coffee time's so important, I get one of these fancy modern K-cup things, that way you guys have awesome coffee, customized coffee, just the coffee you want any time you want, one cup at a time, and coffee time went away. And this really useful ritual that had been part of uh, an information passing thing in the studio went away and it led to problems. So these things are super, super subtle. And I know it's silly to kind of talk about things centering around food, but food is super important to us as humans. In our triune structure of the brain, the back part, the most basic part is like very interested in food and it has strong opinions about food, right? Go into any college cafeteria, right? You go into a college classroom and you look at like people sitting around and you're like, wow, look at this international mix of people. And then you go to the cafeteria and look at the segregation that happens in the cafeteria because there's something in us that's like, I wanna eat with people like me because those other people might take my food, <laughs> right? And then further, it goes the other way, right? It goes the other way. If you, have, if you eat a meal with someone you haven't eaten a meal with before, your brain's like, that dude didn't take my food. I can trust that guy on a kind of a deep fundamental level, <laughs> right? 
So a lot of studios, they do a thing where we're so cool, man. We got free lunches every day. We got an omelet chef who comes at 3 o'clock every day. And you never have to leave the studio. Isn't that great? No, that's not great. Never leave the studio. It means you're kind of stuck in the same rut all the time. And what do you do? You go in, you, the omelet chef, you get your omelet, you go back to your desk. There's no conversation, right? So I don't like to do that. We do that a little bit, a little free food once in a while. But like every day? Because what you want is you want people to get together and go out of the studio because that changes their point of view. And you want them to kind of bond up in social situations. The notion of the hunting party, man, that's an old fundamental notion. And you see it, right? Someone's like, hey, you guys want to get frozen yogurt? And like, oh, okay, yeah, let's all go. And they're going. And you see that walk, right? There's that walk they're doing, <laughs> right? They're just going down to, you know, hunt down a hostess Twinkie or whatever. But... Um, but still, you see it, and there's a sort of bonding that happens around it or, uh, when that happens, and a lot of useful conversation happens there. So when you give out free food at a studio, you're often blocking really useful information flow. Um, also, I'm very cheap. Okay. <laughs> so another uh, flow management tool um, is the, just social factors. So much about information is about who likes who and who likes talking to whom. Look at this team. That looks like a team that is going to communicate pretty well, right? You can tell just by kind of looking. Like, these guys are very, very comfortable with each other. They're going to be, it's going to be easy for them to share information with each other. So now there's been a lot of research about this. Some of the most interesting, I think, is this research by Dr. Anita Woolley. Um, and it's all about the notion of collective intelligence. We've had intelligence tests for years and years and years. We understand about measuring individual intelligence. Her question was, what about the intelligence of a group? How does that work? Now, a lot of people would say, well, that's easy. You just take the IQs of everybody in the group and you average it? No, you take the maximum? No, you take the min? I don't know. What do you do? And she found it has nothing to do with that. The intelligence of the people in the group individually doesn't matter very much in terms of the collective intelligence of the group. Her studies found that there were exactly three factors that were critical when it came to the intelligent behavior of a group. And she did this by giving groups these different uh, tests. So here are the three factors she found were really relevant. The first one is, how do people perform on the eyes test? Okay, so the eyes test is this interesting test where you see a lot of pictures like this, right? How is she feeling right now? A, B, C, or D? So think about that, see if you got the answer. All right. All right. All right, hands up for A. Hands up for B. Hands up for C. Hands up for D. Okay. The correct answer is A. Okay. All right. You go, Harley. Anyway, um, <laughs> groups that have people who performed really well on this test because some people are great at it and some people are really bad at it. Groups who had people who are really good at this ended up being more intelligent. Second one, conversational turn-taking. They measured the amount of times that people interrupted each other. Groups that interrupted each other a lot behaved really stupidly. <laughs> Groups that let each other talk, let each other finish, and were good, had a good balance of conversational turn-taking, they behaved very intelligently. And number three, get ready. Boom goes the dynamite. More ladies in the group made it behave smarter. Okay. Now, so, and, and groups with no ladies, they had certain pathologies that were really, really bad. And I'm sure some of us have seen this, right? You got a group of dudes all together, and they're like, we should put in nine features. No, let's put in 10. No, let's put in 11. That's awesome, let's do it, right? And, you, and then that's how you get a year late, right? That's totally how that happens. But there's something that happens. It's not that if there's a woman in the group, it's not that the, the woman comes in and says, no, everybody stop. Everybody behaves different. Again, the back of the brain behaves a little different. The male brain behaves a little different when the ladies are around, right? It's like, let's put nine, no 10. No, actually, you know, maybe we shouldn't be so dangerous all the time. Maybe we should actually play a little safer. So there's something in that. Now, I got together with Dr. Woolley because I'm like, okay, Dr. Woolley, I've seen a lot of student teams, a lot, like thousands. And I see certain pathologies with all male groups, and I see certain pathologies with all female groups. I've seen some all female groups do some really nutty things that are really, really different. And she said, yeah, you know, honestly, we didn't test the all female case 
uh, and, and she's like, I'm working on it now, but she's like, yeah, I see the same thing, that when there's a mix is when it's best. Um, and so that's really interesting to know and interesting to think about. Exactly why is a little unclear, but it's a thing to think about. And given the game industry isn't very well balanced this way, it's something important to consider. Okay, so we got all those things. So those are some tools you can use. So now let's talk about what blocks information, because there's a lot of things that can block information flow in your studio. A lot of times, oh man, it's too much trouble. Yeah, I was gonna tell him, but I'm busy, and I, 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 I'm just not gonna do that. Another time, oh man, I didn't know. Oh my God, you, got, you guys are building like a vector-based calculation system? I didn't know, we've got one, it's already done. Oh, I, I could have saved you three months of work, I, but I just, I didn't know that you needed it. Another one is noise. Now, of course, there's lots of kinds of noise. There's, the, uh, there's a lot of kinds. There's, there's certainly the noise in your head, you know, you're worried about some personal problem, or oh my God, oh my God, my body, like I'm gonna get fired, whatever. Noise in your head is not gonna help you. So that's, you wanna find ways to reduce the noise in your head. Uh, there's actual noise in the office. Um, you, that can block information flow. Anyone who's ever been to a party at the Minute Gallery knows about that, you know. Hey man, I haven't seen you for a year. And then DJ Earbud comes on. <laughs> for an hour, and like, oh, anyway. So that doesn't usually happen in the office, um, but sometimes, you know, offices can be really noisy. In our place, we put up sound uh, padding uh, around because there was echo that was a little irritating. We put the sound padding, and it was, it was better. The communication was a little clearer. But then there's other ones, interruptions. People coming and bugging you all the time. A lot of places have developed kind of an informal code of, hey, if I got headphones on, don't bother me. I'm busy right now, right? Um, another one is lying. Right? Lying is a kind of noise on information. I'm, someone, someone's delivering information, but it's not the right information. It's all noised up. And one that we get a lot, noise from the publisher. Mm, yeah, you're trying to make your game, and the publisher comes in with some weird thing, and really? That's not a good, uh, And it kind of noises up a lot of your information. There's a lot of meddling that publishers do, and, and, and people get frustrated about that. But uh, Stephen Beeman explained this with the Beeman's meddling matrix. So let's talk about this. It's very important to understand the reasons, the good, excellent reasons that there is so much meddling from a publisher. So let's look at these axes. Okay, let's look at uh, projects. Some projects succeed, some projects fail. Some projects have a lot of meddling from the publisher. Some projects have no meddling from the publisher. Okay, so let's look at these four different axes. Think about this from the producer at the publisher's point of view. This is the guy who's gotta oversee this stupid group of game developers that we hired to do this and they're so crazy and what are we gonna do? So this guy's gotta decide how much am I going to meddle on this project because I want it to succeed. What's the right amount of meddling? Well, let's look at this case. So let's say it's a really successful project and the guy meddles a lot. His conclusion will be, my meddling worked. That was excellent, okay. So then let's look at this case. Um, he, he doesn't meddle and it succeeds, then he's gonna be like, oh my God, I'm useless. If anybody finds out how little I was involved in this massive hit, like, it'd be bad. So, man, uh, that would be bad if that happens. So that's incentive to kind of get in there and meddle if a thing's gonna be successful. Now let's look at this one, um, a, a failed project where the publisher was super hands off. That guy's gonna get so beat up by his, his bosses. Like, this thing failed, what'd you do? Well, I wanted to let them go their own way, and oh my God, they're gonna get fired, right? <laughs> it's really bad. And then we have this last quadrant that we see quite a lot, right? Projects where it failed and there was a lot of meddling from the publisher, and then what do they say? I did all I could. I couldn't have possibly done my, I was in there every day. I was in there for two hours every day talking to the team, they still failed. I don't know, I gave them so much direction and I micromanaged all the hell out of it and it still failed. What, what more could I have done? I don't know, right? So like, it's easy to joke about this and stuff, but you can kind of understand that there are incentives to kind of get in there and kind of be involved in the communication, which makes it super important if you're working with a publisher, if you're working with a client, to design the information flow so that they have what they need, so that they feel confident, so they feel like they're doing the best they can um, to, to make it really excellent. Okay, other things that block information flow. Mental ruts, I've always been doing this the same way and uh, I don't really wanna change it and so I'm, I'm, not, I'm gonna ignore this new information. Secrets, shh, don't tell anybody, you can't tell anybody this. Um, that, that's, a, that's what secret is, an information flow blocker. And then fear, oh man. Fear, there's so many kinds of fear in the office. Oh man, they're all over the place, right? People remember Dune, fear is the mind killer, yes. 
All right, so many kinds. Oh, my God, the boss will be really mad if, I, if he finds out about this, so keep it a secret. Oh, Sue's feelings will be hurt if you tell her how much her art sucks, right? So don't, don't tell her that. If I, if I tell people how I really feel about this project, everyone's going to laugh at me. Um, man, I, don't want, I might make a mistake, and everyone would find out. Oh, don't tell the client. They'll be so disappointed if they find out. Just, like, keep it quiet and, like, hope it gets better. Um, man, I, I could lose the respect to the team if I tell them, like, you know, I really blew this, and I don't want people to know, so I'll keep that a secret. And then the one in everybody's heart, everyone will know that I'm a fraud if I tell them what, how I really feel about this. Okay, so that's, fear is an information blocker, and you've got to be aware of it in yourself, you've got to be aware of it in other people, and you've got to find ways to reduce that fear so that it's okay to share the truth. You want to create opportunities for the truth to go through. I found as my studio's gotten bigger, it's been super hard for me because truth, truth to power is really, really hard. The bigger you are and the higher you are up the ladder, the less people want to tell you the truth because they're scared of getting fired or you being mad or whatever. So you have to work really hard to find ways to make sure people are comfortable and getting the information out. So related to this, fascinating research uh, by, uh, by Castaro and Lobo here. Okay, they're looking at... Uh, what makes people succeed in companies? Okay, so here's the thing we often think about. Um, the relationship about competence, we all know about that. We all know about some people are good at what they do, some people are bad at what they do. Then they were looking at the question of how important is likability in the office? Because we all know people who are really great at what they do, but everybody hates them, right? So where do you want to be on this chart? Obviously, you want to be up here, right? You're highly competent, everybody likes you, everybody wants to hire that guy. That's obviously where you want to be. Where don't you want to be? Down here at the bottom, incompetent jerk, right? Guy sucks at what he does, and what a jerk, oh my God, I can't stand him. Um, that's obvious. These guys didn't study that. These guys studied the other two boxes. Hmm. So the question they asked was, hey managers, if you had to hire one of the other two boxes, who would you hire? Would you hire the competent jerk? Great at what they do, I want to wring his neck every single day. Hate that guy. Or would you hire the lovable fool, <laughs> right? Not very good at what they do, pretty bad at what they do, but everybody loves that guy. Every, oh, it's, I mean, it's fun to have around, it's so nice, everybody likes him. I feel really comfortable around them. They found that generally managers, if you ask them who would you hire, they'd say, well, given that choice, I'd hire the competent jerk because you know, it might be a jerk, but he'll get the job done. But if you ask people, hey, who would you want to work with? People would say, oh, if I had to make that choice, I'd pick the lovable fool because, yeah, they're not great at what they do, but at least they're not going to screw everything up for everybody else, right? At least they'll do very little damage. So that's interesting. Then they looked at, okay, let's do a profile of a bunch of companies and figure out which side they favor. Do they favor competent jerks or lovable fools? And then given that, um, how does that relate to the success of the company? And they found that successful companies favored the lovable fools. Now that's really weird. Successful companies favored incompetence. <laughs> All right? It's weird to think about. So they thought, this is really strange. Why is this the case? And what they found was the competent jerks we know are a problem. Because, yeah, they're good at what they do, but they wreck everything for everything else. They block information for lots of people. They keep secrets. They, they make other people want to keep secrets. You always hear people say, oh, man, I hate big companies. There's so much politics. There's politics. What does politics mean? What politics means is I have something that I want to tell somebody, and I feel like I can't, so I tell somebody else. That's it. That's all politics is. Anytime that happens in your organization, you have politics. If you can remove that, then you have no politics in your organization. Jerks make for a lot of politics. Now on the other side, this lovable fool character, like they don't mess things up. Everybody likes having them around. They might not be good at what they do. And here's the thing. Somebody's got a problem. They're all pissed off about something. Oh man, that Benson. God, I hate that guy. Who are they going to tell? The lovable fool is like super likable. People you like, you tell them stuff. You can trust them. And you're like, man, that Benson guy, he's pissed me off so much. And guess what? This person's got a lot of time. Right? 
And part of what makes them so likable is they like they care about they care about what's going on. They're like, oh really? What's up? What's up with Vince? Oh man, he's in this meeting. He said this, and oh geez, that's terrible. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry that happened. And then it bothers them, and then they go and they try and work it out a little bit, right? They might go and talk to Vince, and dude, you know how do you know what people are saying about you? I mean, I just it's I, I, you know, or they, or maybe they'll go talk to Benson's boss and say, man, a lot of people are really unhappy with this guy. I'm not I'm not trying to be a jerk, but I just and. And what happens is all this blocked up emotional information flows through them and gets to where it needs to be and makes everything better. And you know what happens over time? Because everybody likes the lovable fool and they're always helping them, they often get better and better and better and they move up to the lovable star category because people get better at what they do. The, the competent jerk, is he gonna get more likable over time? No way. No way, that doesn't happen. So talking about jerks, I found this interesting book, Never Check Email in the Morning, some interesting business advice, but it had this statement that blew me away, there are exactly six kinds of jerks. I'm like, no way, I could name 150 right now, <laughs> right? But I went through their list and I went through my list and I'm like, God damn, if they hadn't had all my 150 jerks like sorted into six categories. And the thing that blew my mind was like, of these six kinds of jerks, right? Of these six kinds of jerks, they were all information blockers in different ways. The inaccessible jerk, right? Oh, I can never get a meeting with that guy. He has what I need. And I just, oh, I can never get through to this guy. He doesn't answer his emails. Damn it, that guy. Unreliable. When are you going to have that done? Oh, I'll have it done. I don't know, Wednesday. And you're Wednesday. Hey, is it done? Oh, um, no, I don't know. Sorry. Sorry, it's just not. Oh, you're killing you because they're unreliable. Um, someone who's too rigid. They're like, nope, this is the only way I do it. You're like, but, but Bill, it's killing the project, man. It's killing it. And they're ignoring information. Someone who's disrespectful, right? You're worried they're going to spread bad information about you, about other people. And like, you're worried things are going to get twisted and noised up. Vagueness. You know, when's that going to be done? I don't know when it's kind of done. Oh, that's not even information. Like you're pretending it is and it's not. And then people, the unfair jerk. You're worried, man, this, guy's, this guy doesn't treat people fairly. If I tell him the truth, he's going to use it against me. i got to block it and keep it, keep it secret. Anyway, so that's interesting to think about. So looking at this, remember our facts, opinions, and emotions about projects, processes, and people. So we have an org chart. That's one of our tools. And what does that tool do? It manages facts and opinions about processes and people. Okay, makes sense. And then we have our project hierarchy. Like, you know, how, how we manage individual projects. That's about facts and opinions about projects. That covers things pretty well, except emotions are left out in the cold. And if you look at the, uh, the Castro and Lobo research, they use this phrase, affective hubs. That means people you like who, s who spread useful inf information through the studio. In other words, they're like the emotional router for your studio, right? These people are really important because what they do is they route emotional information, some of the most important information, about projects, processes, and people. If you manage not just one org chart, but three of these, and you consciously think about these, it makes a giant difference in your studio. I once had a team that was having a lot of problems, and I realized, man, it's not that they're lack of skill. People were a little rigid. They weren't always great communicators. And um, a resume crossed my desk for somebody who was very inexperienced, but like it was super likable. Some, someone had a re reference, and I'm like, you know what, let's try that. Everything changed. This person with very little skill comes on the team, but all of a sudden all the bad toxins came out of the team and everything got better. Okay, a few more final tips here. I love this book, The Advantage, uh, by Patrick Lencioni. His, his argument is that your biggest advantage in business is a healthy organization. And what does healthy mean? He's basically saying an organization with healthy information flow. And he gives a lot of tips for how to make that happen. Some of his best ones are, if you're running a studio, you have to decide what is important and let people know about it. And not just let them know, you need to over-communicate it. I love the phrase over-communicate because um, it just means I'm gonna tell you a lot of times more than is necessary. Because if I tell you more than is necessary, it improves the chance it's gonna get through. We don't like to repeat ourselves. Um, we don't like to repeat ourselves. We don't like to repeat ourselves. And, uh, but things that are important should be over communicated. Things like a mission statement. Oh man, that's so corporate and bad. No, it's not. It is the reason you are doing what you are doing. If you don't know what it is, then what are you doing? You're just wandering around. And if you haven't figured it out and clearly communicated it, no one else really knows what you guys are doing either. 
Because no one, this is a weird thing to say, people don't just want a job, people want a religion, right? They want to come to work and be like, damn, what I'm doing is important. It is important, and I know why. And if you run a studio, it is your job to make people know and feel that and understand about that. Now, there's lots of other ways of over-communicating things, too. Steve Jobs was very famous for this, right? Um, how does Steve feel about the new prototype? Everyone knew. It was no secret how Steve felt, right? And he wanted things to be excellent. And he wasn't like, oh, yeah, this is excellent. Um, this is really bad. This is kind of in the middle. Nope. He, to, to, in order to communicate that, only excellent was acceptable. In his vocabulary, uh, when he would evaluate your work, it was either excellent and amazing or it was total shit, right? Now, I thought about that a lot when I read that. I'm like, man, am I really going to run around the studio telling everybody whose work is kind of at the B-plus level that it's total shit? No, I'm not going to do that because that's just nasty and rude, right? I just, I can't live that way. There's too much bad news. But there is a word you can use, and so I will give you my very, very useful magic word, unacceptable, all right? <laughs> unacceptable is an objective word that is very, very clear, right? I see what you're doing, and it has its benefits, but man, this thing has to be perfect. So currently, this is not acceptable. This is unacceptable. We need to get this better. You can talk about that in a very clear way. Another tip, an excellent book. Anybody who um, has a brain and a mouth or ears should read this book. Um, it's all about how to deal with difficult conversations because difficult conversations are massive information blockers. There's awkward things that you want to say but you don't want to say. This book is all about how to do it. And the key is that is listening. You go into it, there's like something you're really pissed at a guy about. Um, uh, and the key is not to go in and say, I'm going to tell you this and this and this and this. The key is to say, listen, I feel this way about it. Um, and, and I want to understand your point of view. And then get as much listening as possible. And they give a ton of good tips in there. And if you want to practice listening, oh my god, there's this website, Seven Cups of Tea. Here's the idea of Seven Cups of Tea. The internet is full of people who are full, who are full of strife and trouble. And they can go here, and trained listeners will just listen to their problems and talk with them about it. They don't give advice, they listen. And you can go on there and take a 10-minute video training course about how to become a listener, and you can start doing it today. And oh my god, it totally works. It's crazy. It's crazy how this little 10 minute video can make you into a much better listener. Okay, so wrapping up, um, here's one other book some people may have heard of. Um, Matthew 7, 7, seek and ye shall find. People always say, oh my God, you can't get a studio past a certain point. We're gonna hit these problems. The thing that is true, any problem that you have organizationally in your studio, if you want to solve it and you're focused on solving it, you can solve it. They're all solvable. There are organizations that have 10,000, 100,000 people. These problems are solvable. But if you say, oh, I'm not going to worry about this. I'll let it take care of itself, that's when you get in trouble. But if you look for the solutions, you will find them. But you do have to look for them. OK, so studios with good information flow, they say, I know how to structure management. I know how to manage my projects. Um, we know I don't have miscommunications with clients because we have the right information flow. We have the right meetings. Those meetings, the meetings we have are good and useful. Our team has good morale because everybody feels good about what they're doing. Our game is on time, yes, and our game rocks, yes. Those are all things that you want. So I'll close up with this, um, this, this quote I love from uh, John Laurie here. Uh, he's a Zen master. If the energy is really flowing freely, the brush paints by itself, the camera photographs, the sculpture forms, the words write, the dance dances. The creator of the art, the subject of the art, and the expression itself merge into a single process in which there is no reflection or evaluation, just the art manifesting itself. When you have solid information flow, that's what the creative process feels like in a group. Thanks very much.